Um, so Facebook Live is starting now. And I'll count down from, from 10 for the, uh, for the webinar to start. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Farida Nabarema and I am very happy to be co-hosting the very first episode of the Resistance Bureau, a podcast on democracy and the struggle for freedom. And I will be joined today by my co-host Jeffrey Smith. We are also joined by Nick Chesaman and Matati Mulochwa, who will guide the Q&A session to close out today's event. This show is being recorded for subsequent distribution and we are going to have a final Q&A session during the last 15 minutes of the program. Be sure to message us your questions as they arise. But due to the time allotted, we can only take one question per person. You can send your question via WhatsApp on, two, on plus 263 77 623 8199. Once again, plus 263 77 623 8191. We can also ask questions on Twitter by using the hashtag, the Resistant Bureau Live. So thank you once again, and I'm going to pass over to my co-host, Jeffrey Smith, to introduce himself. Thank you so much, Frida. Hello, friends. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so humbled uh, to be sharing this space with all of you today, including all of our viewers who are joining from all over the world. Uh, this program will be the first of two pilot episodes for the Resistance Bureau, in which we will delve into and analyze the major threats to basic freedoms in Africa. While the outbreak of the coronavirus has negatively affected the state of democracy in many countries across the continent, and this episode will mainly devote its attention to this subject, it is fair to say that democratic backsliding well precedes the pandemic. In fact, so widespread has been the turn to authoritarianism that it could be classified as a pandemic on its own. Our second episode of the Resistance Bureau will take place on July 22nd, uh, again at 11 a.m. Eastern, and it will follow this theme and cover the topic of speaking truth to power, namely how African journalists and frontline activists are risking their lives to report the facts and hold leaders accountable. Be sure to stay tuned for more details on this event, as well as for updates on the Resistance Bureau podcast by visiting our website, theresistancebureau.com, as well as our related social media pages on Facebook and Twitter. Dear viewers, our listeners, uh, we have very amazing guests for you today, and we are very honored to be in their company. Please allow me to introduce to you Tundu Lisu, he, who is a Tanzanian a politician. He's one of the most known politicians in Tanzania, and he continues to be the flag for democracy despite the authoritarian crackdown under President John Magafuli. He narrowly escaped death when he was shot multiple times in an assassination attempt in 2017. He recently announced plans to return home and we have a very big announcement from you, for, for you from Chundulisu and we want you to stay tuned to hear more from him. Our second guest is our trailblazing human rights activist, singer, musician, artist, leader, an iconic, politician from Uganda, and his name is Bobby Wine. Bobby Wine has been one of the strongest voices speaking against the dictatorial regime of Yoweri, uh, Yoweri Museveni, I'm sorry, in Uganda. And despite being repeatedly intimidated, arrested, and tortured, he continues to struggle for democracy in his country. So thank you very much, Tundu and Bobby, for joining us today. We will be joined in the, in, in the coming minutes by our third guest. But while we go on, we want to hear from this amazing guest telling us about what they have been doing and telling us more about the reality of democracy and COVID-19 in that country. Across Africa, COVID-19 has led to several restrictions from our government. In Uganda, for example, public gatherings have been banned. In Zambia and Guinea, the governments are using the, this opportunity to advance on some electoral projects, despite the, the, um, the grave consequences of the pandemic. We also have situations like military killings, 
police brutality in Kenya, in Togo, and so on. But what we are expecting at this moment is to hear from our guests on what are the realities in their countries. So I'm going to ask my first question to Tundo. Please tell us in Tanzania, we have quite, quite a lot. And Tanzania is one of the very first countries in the world to have announced that they are readed completely of coronavirus. Please tell us what is the reality of the democratic state in Tanzania today. Uh, thank you very much, Farida, and everyone uh, for having me on this uh, uh, program. Um, um, <clears throat> I have been away from Tanzania since September 7, 2017. And uh, whatever information I have uh, from Tanzania and in the current status is based on uh, uh, information that is publicly available that I get from my colleagues. But to, to, to answer your question briefly, uh, since 2015, when President Magufuli <clears throat> came to office, there has been a, an onslaught on democracy. There has been an onslaught on human rights, on rule of law. There has been, there has been it's a general war on democracy. And it has been unrelenting. It has been brutal. It has been uh, a very costly in terms of human lives and in terms of people's freedoms. But please, um, can you tell me a little more about your plans to return to Tanzania? Because you were shot in 2017 and you almost died in the process. Why do you want to go back despite the nature of the Magafuli regime? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, dictatorships can only be fought and defeated if we are prepared to take risks. And uh, running away is not, is not uh, uh, you know, is not going to defeat these di dictators who remove them from office. Uh, and therefore, I'm returning back to Tanzania despite the, the immense risks associated with my return. Hopefully, uh, this time, with the world watching, with the Tanzanian population mobilized, and this is an election year, we have elections um, uh, three, four months away, we'll have enough attention and enough focus on Tanzania that uh, will make the regime of President Magufuli think twice uh, before they do anything that will, will bring the, the, the ire of the world uh, upon their upon their heads. So I'm returning to Tanzania because it is necessary to return and continue. Uh, I said uh, I would use this opportunity to make uh, a big announcement. And the big announcement is I'll be landing in Dar es Salaam on the 28th of July, that is less than three weeks away uh, of this year. Uh, uh, you know, Jeff has already said that I'm running for presidency in the general elections in October. Uh, the, my party's nomination convention starts on the 28th of July and, and on the 29th. So I'm returning on the day when the, 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 the party's nomination convention starts. And um, I think it is the best time to, to return home after all this more, almost three years of um, recovering from the, the consequences of that assassination attempt uh, in September three years ago. So every Tanzanian who is watching, uh, cycle the date, July 28th, 2020, I'll be landing in Dar es Salaam. And, you know, it will be nice to finally go back home to the land I love, to the land of my Wow. Uh, well, Tindu, we certainly uh, applaud your, your bravery. That's amazing. Um, and I just wanted to quickly follow up before we pivot to Bobby here. Um, as, as Farida mentioned, and Tindu, as you know full well, uh, Tanzanian, Tanzanian authorities have often employed violence, um, including the assassination attempt against you in 2017. We also had the recent assault on your party leader. What is your party, Chadema, doing to effectively push back 
against this, albeit amid a global pandemic? What tools are at your disposal? Um, and as we just saw in Malawi, you know, opposition alliances are, are key to, to victory. Is there an opposition alliance in the works in, in Tanzania that you might be able to tell us about? Yeah, we are talking with the with our opposition partners in the country. I cannot uh, I cannot say the status of negotiations thus far, uh, uh, but uh, you know we are talking with our friends. We're talking with our colleagues. My own personal view is we cannot we cannot face President Magufuli and his authoritarian regime. Uh, without uh, presenting a common united front. So I personally um, uh, will support any effort by our parties to present a united front to the people of Tanzania and, and successfully uh, uh, confront President Magufuli. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have Fadzai with us now. Fadzai, are you able to hear us? Yes. I can hear you loud and clear, Jeffrey. I'm so sorry I'm a little bit late, but I'm so glad to be here. Wonderful. Thank you for taking the time. Um, we're going to get to you shortly. Um, I know sure. Frida certainly has some questions for you, but Bobby, are, are you still Great. are you still with us? Bobby, I think you might be on mute. Yeah, I'm am, am I on ah, mute? there he is. How are how are you Very doing great. today? I'm all good. Thank you very much, Jeff. Good, good. I have a quick question for you. Um, following up on yes, what Tundu please. was saying, um, and especially on, on Monday, I noticed uh, you posted a tweet uh, about Ugandan authorities killing people, quote, in the name of enforcing COVID-related restrictions. So this sure. abuse clearly fits a pattern in your country, including the recent assault on Stella Nianzi, um, the, the very unfortunate situation involving Ziggy Wine, which I know hits close to home for you. Um, and as you've told me and, and many others over the years, we're usually only aware of these high profile cases, um, but that there's so much more happening beneath the headlines. I'd like you to tell us and, and our viewers more about this violent trend by Ugandan authorities and what reasons are now being employed by the regime in an attempt to justify these human rights abuses during the pandemic. Oh. Yeah, I like to say that freedom comes to those who fight and not to those who cry, because the more you cry, is the more your people continue to die, to so rise and defend your rights. I love to use the strong words to motivate myself and my friends too. Uh, God, I thank yeah. you, Jay, for having me. Um, and I indeed stand with the world as they battle with the uh, global pandemic of the COVID-19. However, in the context of Uganda, the effects of the coronavirus are even, uh, you know, aggravated by the, 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 the effects of bad governance and uh, a brutal state that we are under the 35-year-old um, dictatorship under President Museveni. Now, um, you talked of Stella Nyanzi. Unfortunately, as we speak now, Stella Nyanzi is still in detention probably uh, unless he's been released um, the last five minutes, but uh, she's still in detention for protesting against the government using the COVID-19 as a milk cow, as a, a cash cow. Um, you notice that, uh, you know, um, owing it to the, you know, the, the, the discipline of the people of Uganda, we have not, uh, lost uh, a single person of the COVID-19. However, the government has used the, 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 the pandemic to brutalize people. As we speak right now in Makere University, the highest uh, institution of learning, a student uh, has been murdered and the police is blocking and confiscating all the surveillance cameras. Why? Because they don't want the world to see this and yet we are in a generation where everything is being covered on camera. That being, as it said, uh, we continue to persevere on, we continue to resist. And I must say, I'm very glad to be on this very first episode of the Resistance Bureau. We continue to resist, just like uh, dictatorships and authoritarian rules have been resisted over the, uh, the years. Uh, Uganda continues to experience um, you know, brutalization. I could talk and talk and talk about that um, all day, but I'm glad that we have a spirit of resistance and we continue to resist 
all those vices. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And, and really quickly before we, we head to Farida and Fadzai, just a quick follow up. Um, I'd be interested, and I'm sure many of the viewers would be interested to know, um, you know, you talk about all these actions being taken by the Ugandan authorities. What have these actions been, um, what sort of impact have these actions had on the people power movement specifically, as well as your plans for the 2021 election? And as we were just talking about with Tindu, you know, as we recently saw in Malawi, opposition unity is often a key to victory. Um, what plans, if any, are underway in Uganda right now to potentially follow this model? And is this something um, you've been following closely? Thank you very much. Um, these actions by the government have, of course, affected our, spirit, our speed of uh, progress. For example, just uh, two hours ago, the police uh, burst into a meeting that I and my team was having with the professors of Makere University. Why? Because I'm seen as persona non grata in the country. And what brings about that? Because I'm challenging the president for the same seat uh, next year. Um, that being as it is, uh, the people of Uganda are doing this in a completely different way. They're all fired up, they're all charged up, and they're looking towards the election. However, I must mention that shamelessly enough, uh, the president invited uh, the electoral commission to his house and uh, gave them orders to organize what he calls a scientific election. Now, that means that uh, people are going to go to elections, but he is not going to allow campaigns. Uh, uh, he is not going to allow uh, candidates to reach out to people, even if, we, even though we have been suggesting to have standard operating procedures because the COVID-19 is here with us to stay and we must learn how to live with it, but be conscious, encourage people to wear masks, encourage people to practice social distance, encourage people to uh, wash their hands uh, regularly and other things, but to ensure that people cast their vote with an informed position. You know, um, he has claimed that uh, people of Uganda should uh, use the internet to campaign and he has uh, advised all the contestants to use the internet. But remember, this is the same president that put a tax on social media. Why? Because young people were speaking out too much, according to him, on the social media. So he put a tax on social media. Every Ugandan who wants to use Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and any other social media must pay a tax of 200 shillings to access social media besides buying the data. So you see that we are living in a country where the government is trying as much as possible to stifle the voices, to make sure people do not communicate, to make sure people do not hear from each other. The other week, I was attending a funeral of uh, one uh, a fan de bell, and we had more than 700 uh, mourners. However, people, activists continue to rot in jail simply because they were uh, you know, found in their office maybe with three or four people. And I must remind the world that la something like two months ago, a honorable member of parliament called Francis Zake was arrested, tortured and beaten and his crime was buying food and packing it in bags and sending it to his vulnerable and uh, hungry uh, you know, uh, voters. Now, that is the challenge that has been, uh, that we have been grappling with. However, I must say we resist because we are optimistic of the future. The election is only um, six months away. We have rejected the orders of the government, the, the orders of the so-called elect independent electoral commission. Why? Because we know that these are not anchored anywhere in the law. Now, our law provides that in the case of a situation like the COVID pandemic, um, an election should be extended uh, for a period not exceeding six months. But here is a gist. Um, in that extension, a state of emergency is supposed to be declared and the current president is supposed to relegate power to the speaker of parliament. Of course, being the dictator that he is, President Museveni does not give up power to anybody. And that means that uh, um, he will have to change the constitution, which is in the offing 
we've heard that the ruling party wants to uh, illegally extend the rule of President Museveni, which we continue to reject. Now, coming to the election and the possible alliances, yes, for the last two years, my team and I have been reaching out to all uh, uh, forces of change. I've had very interesting and very production of productive conversations with uh, Dr. Kiza Besije, with uh, General Mujisha Muntu, with uh, Honorable Nobat Mao, and a few other people that have run for president before. We all agree in principle that we need to front one candidate. What we are yet to agree about is whether they are joining us because all the dynamics point to the fact that uh, Uganda's dynamic being that uh, more than 80% is young people, then a young person will do better. A very well-known house no hold name will do better. And yes, um, you know, the generation at the end of the day takes it because uh, this is the first time that a young person falling in this generation is running for president. However, we look forward to a um, meeting of mine, and we know that when we agree, at least the willing, we could form a coalition of the willing, and we would send the Museveni dictatorship packing. Thank you so much for that, Bobby. Uh, your energy and your optimism is always so much appreciated, uh, and we thank you for, for expanding on those topics. Um, do we still have Fadze on the line, or did, did, we, did we have her drop off? Looks like we may have lost her for a moment. Um, Frida, I'd like to turn it over to you if you have any follow-up questions for uh, Tundu or, or Bobby here. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we are actually lucky to have two prominent potential presidential candidates here. And uh, it is always a good thing to know that we have people who are willing to put their lives on the line, to fight for others and to challenge authoritarianism. My question is going to be a follow-up question to Bobby Wine. In the case of Uganda, we have seen how the government is deploying so much violence and brutality to not only prevent the Ugandan youth and people in general to express themselves, to not only prevent them to organize, but to also terrorize citizens who, who dare question their type of governance. How do you believe in the institutions of Uganda guaranteeing the fairness of the election. Do you think that you can stand a chance when so much effort is put into place by a dictator to remain in power? Because we have seen similar cases in other countries like Togo or Cameroon, where we had very passionate young people, young leaders wanting to bring change and they have succeeded mobilizing millions of people. But the state apparel was still indefatigable. How do you think that the Ugandan institution can be trusted into organizing free and fair elections in the coming months? Thank you very much. I must assert it that we do not, we absolutely have no trust in the Electoral Commission of Uganda and this and or any other institution. And here is the reason. President Museveni has over time um, rendered all institutions of government useless and uh, impotent, for lack of any better word. Why? Because uh, these institutions are filled not with qualified Ugandans, but his cronies and people that feed from his stand. The Electoral Commission, for example, is headed by um, one uh, Justice Biabakama, and this is the same person in 2011 who was a uh, state prosecutor and pinning Dr. Kiza Besije, who was running against President Museveni then, who was uh, pinning Dr. Kiza Besije for rape allegations, which uh, of course turned out to be an absolute lie. Now, these are tight people to the president, who unfortunately is the one that appoints the Electoral Commission. So I must say it right from the onset that we don't have trust in them. However, one might ask, where do we then get our trust from? Our trust, our confidence, and all our power comes from the people of Uganda. And that's why we call our movement People Power, Our Power. Why? Because we know that these institutions are not going to use magic. It is the people that are going to come out and cast their vote and guard it and then watch it be counted and watch it be declared. 
because what we see on the polling station, what comes out of the ballot boxes, is what is going to count. And that is going to be enforced by the people of Uganda. We have seen so many dictators with guns and bombs and missiles, but a people united and standing firmly, of course, in the face and full glare of the international community, we know that ultimately the people of Uganda, just like the people of Sudan, just like the people of Gambia, just like the people of, uh, um, you know, um, uh, Malawi. Um, Burkina Faso, and just like the people of Malawi recently, they have asserted their voices peacefully through a vote, and they have won. I know that many politicians, and especially the government, have been trying to use the media to disempower people and to create a narrative that a, a mere ballot cannot oust a dictator. President Museveni himself has historically said that a mere paper cannot get him out of office. He has uh, in the past referred to himself as a quarter pin of a bicycle, which is forced in and has to be forced out. But we tell him that our generation is a generation that believes in openness. It's a generation that believes in democracy. And indeed, democracy can and will be stronger than any kind of tyranny. Yeah, I'm very happy to see you having so much confidence in the process and believe so strongly in the young people of uh, Uganda. I'm going to have a follow-up question for you in regards to that, but I want to speak to uh, Tundu at this point in regards to Tanzania. Tundu, you are coming back in Tanzania. You're planning on coming back in Tanzania on July 8, 28th, and you have announced it, uh, and you made a big announcement that you plan on running for president. We have had... African president preventing their opposition, uh, their potential opposition candidates from returning to the countries. These things has happened in countries like Togo, in countries like Kenya. Are you certain that you'll be allowed in the country? Uh, well, I, ha I have no reason to believe that uh, I will be prevented from returning to my country of birth. Uh, I, have, I have no reason to believe that uh, they will do so. However, however, should they do so, then we will make the necessary decisions in order to make sure that I return home. I'm not a criminal. I went out of Tanzania. I was actually taken out of Tanzania unconscious. I was shot 16 times by people that the government to this day has not investigated. It says it doesn't know who they are. It doesn't have any, any suspect. It doesn't have a single arrest. There is not a single, uh, uh, you know, uh, arrest, no prosecution, nothing. Uh, parliamentary investigation was uh, 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 sabotaged. There was no report. So the, the, I'm returning home to First, a government which has said is innocent of the attempted assassination on me. And if they prevent me from returning home, they will be telling the world that they are responsible for the, 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 the shooting of September 7, 2017. But as I said at the beginning, I have no reason to believe that I will be prevented from, from returning home. Uh, uh, but we have to we have to prepare for an eventuality. Really. Thank you, Tundu, for that. But I also want to ask you a question about your ticket. Basically, you want to run for president, and of course, you are running to correct the wrongs of the John Magufuli regime. But please tell us a little bit about your plans for Tanzania, because you just made an announcement, and the young Tanzanian listening to you today may be wondering. What do you have better to offer than John Magafuli? And what guarantee can you provide to them that you will not become another John Magafuli? Why should we continue entrusting politicians with their future? Can you tell us about your plan for Tanzania and what you want to do with your presidency? I have spent the past 25 years standing up for justice, standing up for democracy, standing up uh, against the tyranny and uh, against uh, uh, dictatorship, I have I have spent a good a good part of my adult years 
fighting for the people of Tanzania. And therefore, the, 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 the promise that I make to Tanzanians is I will continue standing up for you. I will, stand, I will still continue calling out those who abuse our people's rights, those who want to turn our country into a person of fiefdom. Uh, uh, as to guarantees, I will say this. My position has all along been a major social, economic, and political transformation of Tanzania away from the, the, the foundations that the country has been on for the past, for almost the past 60 years. Uh, Tanzania is founded on a principle called imperial presidency. Our president is an emperor. He's almost accountable to no one except his God. Now, we want a democracy. We want a rule in which our leaders are accountable to us, to those of us who elect them, and not, and not tyrants and emperors who lord it over, over, over us. And my personal, my personal record uh, 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 you know, speaks for, for, for itself. We want change uh, uh, of the Constitution. We want political change. We want economic change. What the president has done these past five years is to try and take the country back 30, 40, 50 years to the period between 1967 and 1984 of a state-dominated economy. That model failed in the early 80s. We cannot go back to those, to those years of hunger and perpetual shortages. And so my, my, my promise is that. Uh, elect a new deal. Elect, come October, uh, go to the polls, elect leaders and parties that will change the course of our history. 60 years of imperial presidency is enough. We need a fresh beginning. We need a new deal. And that new deal cannot come from the same people who have been loaded, loading it over us all these years. It cannot come from the same party. Yesterday and the day before, they are holding their party congress next week, and uh, they are using prisoners, prisoners, to put up their 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 flags all over Dodoma, our legislative capital. They they, have, they are completely discredited in, in in the eyes of, of of Tanzanians. Now they are relying on prison labor, on forced labor. To put up their 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 election the, the, the posters for their their national party congress, these people are finished. We go to the polls in October to get rid of them for for good, to consign CCM to the dustbin of history. And this is the opportunity. Uh, guarantee the people of Tanzania will have will have a fresh beginning. Will not will change the constitution will create a better and more democratic constitutional order, which will ensure that leaders, future leaders, will be held accountable by the people. Thank you, Tundo. And before I pass over to my co-host, Jeff, and Jeff, I'm sorry for... <laughs> no, please, kind of like, this is great. <laughs> yeah, before I pass over to you, Jeff, I want to go back to Bobby Wine because I have this very... Um, question that I that that is urging me. Um, the case of Uganda is pretty similar for the case with the case of, of Togo. Uh, Togo has been ruled by the same family for 53 years, and we have had countless elections, and the elections happen the same way. The government deploys militaries all over the country. They have a full control of the electoral. Uh, commission, the, the basically uh, stuff ballots on election day, they still, they even go as far as removing uh, opposition members from the electoral commission, from the uh, uh, um, uh, electoral commission headquarters uh, and lock themselves in and give results. So in the case of Togo, for example, a lot of people have even lost faith in the electoral pro process because they don't see how they can win when the other uh, uh, side is coming heavily uh, uh, guarded with guns and when the whole system is flawed. Now, you told me that you count on the young people of Uganda, on the, the people of Uganda 
leader to mobilize and defend and guard their votes. And you give examples of countries like Burkina Faso and Sudan, where the people were able to resist and defeat the dictators. But in those cases, the people resisted and defeated the dictators, not through elections, but through citizens uprisings and sustained resistance and a revolution. So my question to you is, if your bid for an election fails in terms of Uganda, uh, uh, Museveni succeeding at proclaiming himself the winner of the elections, are you able and capable to mobilize the young people of Uganda behind you to reclaim their power through a revolution? Are you willing to do that? And do you see the possibility of that happening? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to agree with you that yes, dictators behave that same way. Um, when you read the book, they did the, the dictator's handbook, but also Hello. studying, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. I was saying that uh, uh, it is clear that all dictators- I can hear you now, yes. Yeah, I was trying to say that all dictators, particularly here in Africa, and indeed all over the world, seem to be reading from the same playbook. However, um, even that can be studied and defeated. It all mean, it needs three things. One is to organize. Number two is to organize. Number three is also to organize. What do I mean this way? I just want to, start, uh, to, to explain it by giving examples. When I said I was running for, for member of parliament and indeed was speaking truth to the regime in Uganda, five billion Ugandan shillings, and that's uh, slightly above uh, $1.5 million, was invested by the government in my constituency, buying off young men and women, uh, telling them not to vote for me. But all we had to do is mobilize the people, sensitize them, then organize and yes, we did that. Um, it has been said that for a dictator, it does not have to be a unanimous decision. It has to be a knock out. So yes, we massively won President Museveni in the Chad on the East uh, by election. We sampled the same thing in, five, in four other constituencies, namely in Jinja by election, in uh, Rukunjiri by election, in... Uh, and uh, Bujiri by election, and yes, in Arua by election, where I was almost assassinated. And it worked when we realized that when we mobilize people massively, they'll come out massively to vote, and yes, they will uh, stand and guard their vote. We managed to win President Museveni in all these four, in fact, five very decisive uh, parliamentary elections. And we agreed that if we multiply that effort in the more than 400 constituencies, if we say times 400 in uh, different other constituencies, we indeed can be able to sweep the dictatorship off its feet. That explains why we have spent the last two solid years as, um, sending out our message and not only telling people that they can free themselves, but showing them how, and that explains the confidence that I have going into the polls. It goes further to explain why President Museveni is trying to do everything within his powers to either uh, cancel the election or to play around with it. That's why he wants a so-called scientific campaign so that he can have a scientific election and yes, come out with scientific declarations. Um, we know that uh, dictators don't always declare the true results. But if this is happening in the eyes of the Ugandans, right from casting their ballot to counting it, President Museveni and his cronies will have no option. We know that he has always tried to use violence. We know that he has always uh, intimidated the Electoral Commission. But he has never come face to face with an entire generation. And that is what is happening in Uganda today. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that this is a revolution. A revolution has already started. It started a while ago and is still ongoing. So yes, um, the people of Uganda 
will rise up if President Museveni tries to disrespect their voice. The people of Uganda will rise up and they will send him packing, like they did to his friend Omar El Bashel in our neighboring country, Sudan. Thank you uh, so much, Bobby and Tindu. I have so many questions for you, but we wanted to reserve Thank you. this Thank you time. So much for the wine. Yeah, um, we wanted to reserve this time for questions from our audience. So what we're going to do right now for the next few minutes is kick it over to our colleagues, Dr. Cheeseman and Mentate. Um, I understand we have many questions uh, from our from our live audience. So please, um, we'd love to hear them. Thanks so much, Jeff, and it's a fantastic show so far, so thanks for all of the great comments. Um, I'm going to kick us off with sort of a thought from, I guess, the more kind of academic research literature that I want to ask our, our great panel. You know, one of the things that we know if we look at, say, the survey data or the election results for most African countries is that the opposition party does much better in urban areas, and it often struggles to penetrate into rural areas. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, in urban areas, you've got a higher density. It's often easier to mobilize people quickly and for a less expense. It's also true that in rural areas, we see obviously ruling parties often find it easier to dominate the media. They often find it easier to use traditional leaders to control people, limit access to resources, use food as a way of controlling people. So I guess one of the things I wanted to ask the panel and this sort of general question for everybody is, how do you kind of go about converting a strong urban base into being able to penetrate the rural areas and actually being able to win those votes that you need to win to actually get over the line in an election? So that's just a sort of reflection from the research. But my colleague Matadi is also going to take, bring to us now one of the questions that we've been getting lots of questions coming in on WhatsApp. Please do keep sending them in. The details are in the chat. If you want the number, please do send us a question. So over to you, Matadi, for a first question from our audience. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I think this has been a great um, engagement. And one of the questions that's coming up, it's actually cutting across to all of the speakers has been dead. Uh, what are your three strengths that you feel that um, your movement has that can give confidence to those people on the fence that are supporting you? I think this question is also coming in uh, with someone from France, Marlene from France, who's asking, how is this new generation you're trying to target? How is this new approach that you're bringing in um, actually coming in to boost the confidence or is there some sort of resignation from the people that you're targeting? Should I start? Please, Tundu. Well, with regard to uh, uh, Nick's question about uh, the, the urban strongholds for the opposition versus uh, rural, uh, uh, you know, rural uh, voting bears, uh, the Tanzania is a, a, a slight, uh, a slightly an exception. If you look at the, 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 the record of multi-party elections in Tanzania since 19... 95, when we had uh, our first multi-party election, the truth is uh, the, the opposition has done much better in rural areas as compared to the urban centers. It's only during the last two general elections in 2010 and in 2015, that's really when we, we started conquering the, the cities and towns, but historically, we started by getting, getting votes uh, in rural constituencies. My own constituency, Singida Mashariki in central Tanzania, is one of the most rural, one of the most deprived areas of, of Tanzania. But we put in the effort, we put in the work, and uh, I won the constituency twice, uh, in 2010 and in again defended it in 2015. The key issue that faces us in, in, in Tanzania, for instance, is a question of resources. It's all about the ability to be present at every polling station, wherever it is, be it in rural areas or in urban areas. If you are not present in rural, in, 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 in voting and, 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 and counting stations, you are defeated. So it is presence, presence, presence. And presence means resources. It means the ability to carry out campaigns throughout the two months of the general election. It's about the ability to uh, uh, mobilize uh, uh, not only voters, but to mobilize polling agents to train them on the tasks 
that they need to perform on the, the, the big Sunday. Our elections always take place on the Sunday. So the big Sunday, you have to be present in every polling station. You do that way, you win. It's, it, we have won an, a, even under the most terrible and the most trying uh, circumstances because we have been present in polling stations. Uh, with regard to the second uh, question from Farida, uh, <clears throat> from Antate, sorry. Our key strengths, uh, speaking specifically about the opposition in Tanzania and my party in particular, after five years of unrelenting assault and violence from the Magufuli regime, we are even stronger organizationally than we were in 2015. What happened in 2015 when President Magufuli came to office, he prohibited all lawful political activity. We were always able to uh, build our membership through mass meetings. After they were prohibited, we went underground. And during these five years, we have built an organization that is uh, present in almost every small locality in Tanzania we have, with, with elected leadership, we have recorded, we have a media platform that has 6.7 million members of my party. We know exactly where they are. We know who they are. We, so, so going to these general elections, we, we can start by relying on the 6.7 million members that we have, we have countrywide. We are stronger than we have ever been at our, in, in, in our entire history. And it is because we were forced to survive these five years of dictatorship, these five years of, 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 of state violence. We have President Magufuli uh, uh, on, on, in February of 2016 declared on national TV that uh, he, would, he would see to it that by 2020, there is no political opposition in Tanzania. We have reason we have risen from the ashes. We are still alive and kicking. We are strong. We are ready to confront him come October. And Bobby, do you have a response to those two questions as well? Uh, could you kindly ask the two questions? I'm sure I've been taken away by uh, Tundu's submission. That's okay, we understand. Uh, so the first one was really about, um, you know, a lot of opposition parties get strength in urban areas, but find it sometimes harder to penetrate into the rural areas, partly because the ruling party often uses underhand strategies, control of traditional leaders, censorship, use of patronage to try and lock down rural areas. So the first question was about how, you know, parties that have a strong base in urban areas, but not necessarily in rural areas can convert that support and become nationwide parties. And then Mantadi can come in with the second question that we got from our viewers. Um, thank you so much. So yeah, the second question was actually trying to look at, it was coming from Malin France, which was trying to ask like the approach that you're trying to use of the people that you're trying to, to like re, um, um, reinstate the confidence in the in the electoral process. The question has been about: Is there really um, so, so a sort of agency among these people, or there is uh, a resignation of some sort? And then there was also a question around: What are the strengths that you have as a movement that could work to boost the confidence of those people that sit on the fence and could potentially be your supporters? Uh, thank you very much. For starters, uh, I want to say I, I agree with you. The government in Uganda is doing what all dictators do when you're explaining, made me feel like you live in Uganda. Unfortunately for us, it's beyond the underhand of the government. They even use, they also use the overhand as well because uh, the impunity in Uganda is not hidden anymore. They uh, profile us and uh, not only block us from um, traveling, but uh, the uh, President Museveni has used what uh, in the past and even currently what he uses the uh, Public Order Management Act, which prohibits any meeting of more than five people. They have also um, deliberately intimidated TV and radio stations. And just yesterday, the minister of ICT came out to warn radio stations against hosting me, it, uh, just after saying that we shall only be communicating to people through TV and radio. 
thereby effectively saying that I'm not supposed to communicate to any Ugandan, even if I am going to be running for president in the country. However, I am confident to inform you and the world that President Museveni is meeting a competitor like never before. He has never met any candidate like myself. Why? Because besides Uganda being a predominantly young population and uh, I falling in those uh, lines, not only in the rural urban area, not only in the urban areas, but in the rural areas too, Uganda is predominantly young and these people connect with all of us. But not only that is our confidence source. Here is the biggest confidence source. I am an artist and I've been performing for close to the last 20 years. So I am a household name. I am in everybody's living room, including President Museveni. My name has been communicated and it's not only music for entertainment that I've been singing, but I've been singing edutainment. I've been talking about the same things that I'm going to be presenting in my manifesto. So we are confident that the candidate that my team is presenting is a candidate that is just going to sweep over. And that is one major source of our confidence. I was also asked um, whether, um, no, I was asked uh, about what we can do to instill confidence in the people. I must say that our people are confident already, but the confidence is just increasing. Uh, why? It has been evident from wherever we go that we have mass support. So the population is actually working out to inspire others. And indeed, it has been our campaign, each one, teach one, each one, reach one. And we have been succeeding. We continue to succeed. So um, our people have done it in the past. Like I explained much earlier, they've done it in the past by elections. And it's the same style, the same fashion that we are going to use to sweep the entire election. Thank you very much. I think we're going to be able to get a couple of quick questions in if we have quick responses and wrap up on time. So let's press ahead. Another one for me is, you know, one of the things that we often debate is the role that the international community should play in these processes. And some people argue that they should get involved because tacitly they're actually helping some of these governments to survive by aid programs and other things. Other people say they should you know, basically back off because these are domestic processes and if the international community gets involved, it looks like the pressure for change is coming from outside when it's really coming from below from the people. So I'd love to get your perspectives as, you know, the next generation of leaders in Africa. What's your perspective on what the international community should be doing in your particular cases? And then we'll take one more question from those that have been sent in and we'll let our panel wrap up. Mentale, over to you. All right, thank you. So I think this question kind of tallies with the one you just gave. So someone, um, it's Joseph Nderita from Kenya. So the question is, we don't see the African Union speaking against injustices in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and across other African countries. The question is, is this union still relevant? Should I take the lead? Please do. With regard to the first question, what can the international community do is to offer solidarity to those who are fighting for democracy in our countries. Our governments and our states are signatories to international treaties, uh, international human rights treaties and conventions that uh, 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 require, among other things, the governments to respect the rule of law, governments to respect human rights, and human rights include the right to vote, the right to organize, the right to form political parties and so on and so forth. And therefore, our governments have placed themselves as members of the international community and they should be held accountable on that basis only. They should be held accountable on the basis of their international obligations. If they did not want to be subject to, inter to rules of international good behavior, they should never have signed up onto those treaties. They should have declared themselves beyond the pale of the international community and see if they could, they, they could survive that. But since they are part and parcel of these international human rights norms international, that demand respect for democracy, they cannot, they cannot uh, hide behind 
the argument that these are domestic matters that and we, they, there should there should be no interference. If you sign up to these international norms, you will be held accountable if you breach them. With regard to the uh, uh, African Union and whether it is relevant or not, I think our people need to to name and shame. It is not just the the the, 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 the Africa Union. It is our regional. Uh, uh, you know, our regional bodies, our East African community, SADC, ECOWAS, and so on and so forth. We should hold everyone who we have given the responsibility to, to take care of our welfare to account when we see that our people are being brutalized, our, our people are being uh, subjected to misrule, and these institutions that use our taxpayer money to, 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 to operate are keeping quiet. So it is not just the African Union, it is all these regional uh, bodies and international bodies as well. Well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how clean the UN system comes out of these uh, 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 situation. We, we, you know, we, we tyrants have continued to receive uh, support and succor from the inter international financial uh, institutions. They have continued to receive a support from the United Nations agencies. Uh, we should hold everybody, everybody to account for uh, uh, on the basis of these uh, human rights uh, norms that I have, I have referred to. Thank you very much. And over to you, Bobby. Uh, thank you very much. And I thank Tundu for their uh, solid communication to the international community. Well, um, I was more or less uh, well represented, um, but to put it in more clear terms, I will ask the international community, stop sponsoring our oppression. We have said it before and we continue to see it again. It comes out on the news when a dictatorship has illegally killed people and they're not held accountable. And the next news you, you're seeing is uh, low millions uh, of dollars coming from the donor community. Please hold our leaders, and in particular, hold General Yoweri Kabuta Museveni responsible. You know, hold him accountable. Make the rule of law and human rights observation a precondition for cooperation. Stop sponsoring our oppression. You know, um, just in this COVID situation, you notice that Uganda has received loans way up to six trillion. Six trillion Uganda shillings is a uh, uh, more than $1.5 billion. All this money is going to be paid by us young people, our children, and their children's children. But why must we be paying for our own oppression? So kindly um, look at the morality, they look at the values that we share as a human race and ask our leaders why they do not observe them. Uh, to the international media, we thank you so much. And uh, we uh, request you to keep your eyes on us, keep your eyes on the oppressed people. Further on the international community, we know that uh, President Museveni has presented himself as the anchor of stability, especially in the Great Lakes region. That is a hoax. That is a lie. He has presented himself as a, a leader that uh, welcomes refugees. But have you taken time to study where uh, the, situ the, the circumstances that cause that refugee influx into Uganda and what causes those instabilities, the wars in Central African Republic, in the Congo, in Sudan and others, please investigate that. Otherwise, you will continue to come off as partners in crime with a dictatorship that is killing people and abusing human rights in Uganda. And yet we look at you, especially the developed world, as the custodians of human rights and the rule of law. Um, about the African Union and the East African community and all the regional uh, cooperation bodies, we also call upon you, man. Um, you know, don't misrepresent Africa. Let the African Union and the African East African community, don't let them look like a club of dictators. Let it be um, the policy of, of, of values in Africa. Africa and Africans 
have suffered so much. So our generation in 2020 should not continue to suffer at the hands of our leaders. We are not a third world continent. We only have third world leaders. And it's you, our leaders, that are going to paint a picture of Africa. I was talking to some friend and I was getting embarrassed um, asking them what the problem of Africa is. And he was saying, problem number one is leadership. Problem number two is leadership. And problem number three is leadership. So offer us the kind of leadership that we can be proud of, the kind of leadership that you want other younger Africans to learn from. With that, we are going to enjoy Africa because Africa deserves better. Africa is rich, but the Africans are suffering. That should not be the case. This message goes out to all of you leaders, but most importantly, the Africans, because the leaders are not going to do the right thing unless if we hold their feet to the fire and demand for accountability. I thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for thank you so much for that response. And just maybe to close from my end, this comes as a question that we can take home, both the listeners as well as the speakers. Um, so Zimbabwean-based diaspora academic and public observer of elect, um, African politics, Alex Magaisa is actually trying to reinstate the need for solidarity among opposition parties across the continent. And his question really comes in to say, what are you doing as a party, as a movement to sort of like create networks that can help um, in sort of like learning from each other and improving on the kind of politics that you bring to the people so that you can um, confront those ch um, shared challenges because clearly the challenges that you are highlighting actually cut across the continent. So I think it's something that we can think about um, as we wrap up the show and go back home. Absolutely. So thank you, Nick and Matade, for facilitating that amazing interactive session. Thanks so much to our listeners. We ran a bit short on time. This went by very fast. Uh, the response has been overwhelming and we are so appreciative. Please do not hesitate to follow up with us via our website and our social media platforms. We are definitely happy to carry on these important conversations there. Um, Frida, over to you for some farewell remarks. Well, thank you so much um, to both our listeners and our viewers, and most importantly, our guests, Tundu and Bobby Wine. We do really hope to see your passion materialize, and we do really hope to, and we are very happy to have people like you fighting for the continent, and people like you give us faith and uh, uh, strength, and I really, really do hope that each one of you will make great leaders for both Uganda and Tanzania. So to our viewers, thank you for joining the very first episode of the Resistance Bureau. As you have noticed, we didn't have enough time for all your questions, but we can continue the conversation on our social media pages, and we will be very happy to see you in our second episodes in the coming weeks. Thank you very much once again, and thank you to our technical team, and thanks as well to our colleague, Dr. Chisman and Matate. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for having me, guys.